welcome everyone to our regular Wednesday night service. Uh, once again, coronavirus is keeping us from gathering together as we would normally do and we prefer to do. As a result, we're offering um, our regular Wednesday night uh, Bible study uh, live on Facebook. So hopefully uh, you, you're, you're here, you've gathered here, and uh, you can join us in this endeavor. What we want to do is uh, start out with uh, a couple of uh, important announcements. Um, and uh, if you follow us on Facebook, then you will be familiar uh, with these. Uh, the first thing we need, uh, we want to announce is uh, this Sunday morning, we plan on hosting Sunday school. Now, we're still not having any services here at the church and that we're encouraging people to come. Rather, what we're doing is uh, we are hoping to use technology for that. But instead of just airing Sunday School Live, uh, we are going to be using Zoom. Uh, if you don't know what Zoom is, Zoom allows for like conference calling in person, uh, sort of like what FaceTime is. So uh, what you can do is if you have not already received a, an invitation from us, um, it has a link in your email, uh, be sure to, to download um, download the app and uh, we'll send you an invitation. If you have not received an invitation from us yet, um, be sure to uh, let us know. You can email us at the church or call the church office tomorrow or Friday and we will send you an invitation. Uh, one of our members, Danny Stevens, is uh, a, a, an excellent Sunday school teacher. Uh, I wouldn't tell that to his face. Um, but no, he, he is an excellent Sunday school teacher. He's agreed to meet us at 9.30 Sunday morning um, and to teach Sunday school. Now, I know that's earlier than what we usually do, but uh, we've got some kinks that we'll probably have to work out. And I want to make sure we still have time to set everything up for our worship service. So 9.30 Sunday morning, you can join us through Zoom for Sunday school. That will allow us to interact with each other, to ask questions, to, to add comments, or, and uh, we can also do prayer requests and all that sort of stuff. Um, these things uh, we're not able to do as well um, with live streaming. Um, so join us Sunday morning, 930, for Sunday school. Uh, in addition to that, uh, a lot of people have called and contacted us. And that's just about how to continue giving to the church. Uh, and there's a couple ways you can do that. One is you can go to Facebook right now, and I assume you're watching this on Facebook. Otherwise, I don't know how you're doing it. Uh, but you can watch or you can donate on Facebook. So it should be uh, near the top but on the right side of your screen, uh, especially if you're watching this on a desktop, uh, is a donate, donate button. You can click that and give 100% to the church. The church is working as fast as we can on getting other online giving options. Uh, we're going to go through LifeWay, and uh, we hope to have those available on our website soon. And when we have that, we will let everyone know. Uh, but beyond that, you can still give in person, you can give by mail, uh, something like that. So uh, as of now, uh, we'll be in the office tomorrow, hopefully Friday. But given the restrictions, I don't know how long we'll be allowed uh, to carry on. But in the meantime, you can mail it or you can uh, drop it off personally. Another announcement worth making, and that this is something I'm, I'm, I really hope that we can do. Uh, since we're moving so much to online, uh, we want to encourage you to share your story. Now, what that involves is uh, we're looking for people to give about a three to five minute uh, testimony. And you can share your story how you came to faith, how God has healed brokenness, how God has, has shown up in your marriage, or, or whatever it, it might be. If you would like to record about three to five minutes of this, you can do it on your phone and send it, send it to me. Or you can come by the church uh, and we can use our uh, technology. Uh, I'd like to air those on Sunday evenings. Um, so uh, if that's something you're interested, uh, please reach out to us and uh, we can get you connected with all of that. Uh, in terms of other announcements, uh, really some of the same things we, we've been doing, I want to encourage you to um, uh, call at least three people this week um, and 
and uh, reach out to them, encourage them, uh, pray for them, and uh, ask how you can serve them. I know we're getting more and more limited in terms of personal contact, but if we can call, text, use social media to our advantage, uh, that that would be a very good and very important. For those who have been assigned uh, church members or people in your Saint school class, please keep doing that uh, at least until we get through this crisis. Well, lastly, uh, we want to encourage you to continue to share your individual resources. Um, every morning around 8 o'clock, assuming that everything loads and, and, and it works just fine, um, but we are posting a daily devotional. So uh, today we, we started the book of Galatians. It coincides with your daily reading for the year. So if you will read before the, the devotion, uh, and uh, you'll have your daily reading in for that day. And you know, take 15 minutes. You can watch or listen to, to the devotion. And uh, not only will you have read the text, you will have some understanding of what the text says. Uh, in addition to that, we're obviously doing live stream on Wednesday nights and Sunday mornings. And we encourage you to, to share those. Remember what our vision in general is. We want um, to spread the good news of Jesus online in much the same way coronavirus is spreading uh, around the world. We hope that through sharing and everything else, um, we can get the message of Jesus out to the rest of the world. Well, those are our announcements. Again, usually what we do on Wednesday nights, whenever we're all gathered here, is we like to uh, solicit prayer requests. Um, and then we pray for each of those specifically. Prayer is a central ministry of our church, a central ministry of, of any believer. Now, uh, I, we're not going to pray for specific prayer requests, you know, people who are sick or in the hospital or in need or whatnot. But what I do want us to do is to take time to pray uh, regarding the continued COVID-19 plague. Um, many say that it's going to get worse before it gets better. I've, I'm not an expert on any of this. I watch the same things y'all watch, and I hear the same things y'all hear. Um, we want to pray that it doesn't get worse, right? We're, the worst has already passed us. But we want to pray for those involved. So let me... Let me um, say specifically who we want to pray for. We want to pray for medical officials. They're working a lot of hours, and they've been going at this for several weeks. Um, we want to pray for their perseverance. We want to pray that they get rest. Uh, we pray that they uh, are able to continue to serve. Also, we need to pray that they uh, don't contract the, the disease. Because uh, if, if they do, then they uh, can put entire hospital people at risk, not to mention family and friends and everything. So we're going to ask that the Lord uh, protect them and continue to use them for the good of public health. We also want to lift up the victims and their families of this disease. Uh, the number of cases uh, around the world in America and Kentucky and even in Frankfurt continue to climb almost by day. And um, it continues to to affect a lot of people, the tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people um, that we know of. And, and with each case, there is a family suffering with them. And some have unfortunately lost their lives. And we want to lift up their family as well. Thirdly, we want to pray for gov government officials. Let's be honest. Uh, there is no blueprint for how to lead a nation, city, states, or not through this crisis. We're all just trying to figure this out on our own. And, and let's pray that, that partisanism is, is a thing of the past, but rather we work together uh, for, for the good of public health, for the good of our economy, and for the good of our nation, uh, our state, and our city. Fourth, we, we, want, we do want to pray for our economy. I, I'm not a doctor. I'm not an economist. Um, I, I studied theology in school. Uh, but uh, there is real concern regarding our economy and, and the ripple effects of that. Businesses continue to close by, by government fiat, but, but also there is the fear that many won't open again. And I don't know the answer to, to, to any of this sort of stuff. I really don't. Uh, but uh, the economy affects all of us, uh, from our retirement plans to, to uh, day, meeting day-to-day -day needs, from going to the grocery store to, to paying health insurance and, and all that. So, so we want to pray for our economy. 
Finally, um, we want to pray for the hope of the gospel. Let it be that this crisis calls our nation, our state, and our community to seriously consider their soul. So long as things were going as planned and the economy was booming and, and all this sort of stuff, we could distract ourselves from these important issues of life, death, and eternity. Increasingly, we, we can't ignore those anymore. So let it be that people turn back to the Lord. So we want to pray again for medical officials, victims and their families, government officials, our economy, and the hope and healing work of the gospel. So will you join me in this time of prayer? Our Father, we ask that you would be so kind as to use us, to guide us, to help us through all this. Um, Lord, I, I, I don't know how many people may be watching this live or later archived, but Lord, together, we all come together that, that we may lift up these needs to you, knowing that you hear us and you answer prayer. So Lord, I, I want to begin by, by lifting up to you the medical, medical officials and staff who are helping us um, on the medical side of the, this crisis. Uh, many people are suffering, and there are many on the front lines of this fight who are in hospitals and, and doctor's offices and, 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 and ambulances and everything else. Lord, would you, would you be so kind as to give them rest, give them perseverance, give them clarity of thought, protect them from, from succumbing to, to disease and catching it and, and thus spreading it. But Lord, just, just put, put your hedge of protection around them. Lord, I want to thank you for modern medicine. I want to thank you for uh, the, the system we have by which we have confidence that um, if we get sick, we, there, there is a room for us. And Lord, that is becoming a serious issue. So would this disease uh, leave? And um, may our hospitals and, and our system not be overrun and threatened uh, because of its, of its spread. Lord, likewise, I will lift up to you the, the victims of this. There are some who have uh, gotten the disease and overcome it. Uh, some who may not even know they had it. Uh, but then there are those who... who uh, got the disease and died from it. Lord, I, I'm going to ask that you, you you heal the sick, you comfort the grieving. For there are victims around this world because of this singular virus. Would you be so kind and may the gospel speak peace and comfort to the victims and their families. But we also would lift up to you government officials. Would you be so kind as to give them wisdom, strength, knowledge, sermon in all of this. Lord, I want to thank you for leaders who are taking this seriously and to help us navigate these, these waters. This is a difficult time to be in public service. And I want to thank you for their service. And would you help them as they seek to help us at this time? We also want to lift up to you our, our economy. There's clearly a deep need regarding the economy. Could, could you help us figure this stuff out? Lord, I, I don't have all the answers, and, and, and I'm sure everyone watching right now, we, we all have our opinions. But Lord, would, would you help us in this regard? Um, the well-being and the security of a lot of people are at stake. Would you be with those who are business owners, and those who, who work regular jobs, and, and are, are really scared right now on the economic side of things? Would you bring comfort and assurance to each and every one of us in this time? All right, Lord, I want to ask that you, you be with the hope of the gospel. Our greatest hope is not for a robust economy, but for a, a, a people who would embrace and grow in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Would you be so kind to help us with that? But I'm going to ask that, 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 that those who are right now have never received the gospel, may this be a time of reflection to where we take uh, uh, matters of eternity seriously yet again. But may the church be ready to speak the hope and the truth souls. May they be ready to receive the good news of Jesus. So may we see ourselves as missionaries and ministers in, in this, in the, at this dark time. The gospel works best at moments like this. May we see the best of the gospel in this particular moment. Lord, I'm going to ask that you, you, you help us as we study the word this evening. I hope that as we air this live and for others maybe archive that, that we'll have our Bibles open, ready to receive your word, and be transformed by your word. In the name of your glorious Son, we pray. Amen.
Well, we are in Genesis chapter 2 still. Now, I have prepared things to go all the way through the end of Genesis 2. But as you might suspect, especially if you've been following us for the last uh, couple of weeks, you, you may know that um, it is highly unlikely that we will get that far. In fact, I, I can just about guarantee it. Um, so we're in Genesis chapter 2. We left off uh, in verse 17 last week, and um, we want to work our way through it. So what we may do is actually pick up in verse 18 and go to the end of the chapter, but again, we're, we're not going to make it that, that far. So let's read Genesis chapter 2. Start verse 18. It says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will put, I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man to see what he will call them. Whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock and to the birds of the heavens, to, the, to every beast of the field. But for Adam there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the and the rib that the Lord God the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Verse 24, Therefore a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. Well, I know last Wednesday feels like it was 20 years ago. Um, in fact, sometimes I feel like when I think about where we've been the last week, I feel like uh, I'm uh, getting close to retirement. It feels like it's, it's been so long. Um, but to remind you what we did last Wednesday, in, in the uh, previous verses, particularly verse 4 to, to 17, uh, we were looking at the Garden of Eden. Uh, so Genesis 2, some see it as a repetition of Genesis 1, and there's some real controversy there, and I think unnecessarily. Genesis 2, starting in verse 4 to the end of the chapter, really looks at the sixth day of creation in more detail. So chapter 1 is, is a uh, views creation from the perspective of a drone, right? Just right above all of it and gives you uh, the general detail. Day 1 this happened, day 2 this happened, day 3 that happened. Chapter 2, we zero in on a singular day, and that is day 6. It is here we see uh, uh, God's purpose and use of the Garden of Eden. We see God creating man and woman and, and the naming of the animals and marriage and family and all, all that sort of stuff. So it's really a zooming in of that sixth day. Now, uh, what we saw last week uh, in, in our previous study was the setting of the narrative. Okay, so, so what we see is where does all of these things take place? Well, we see that it takes place in a garden which is within the larger Eden. Now, we call it the Garden of Eden, and that is true. It, it, the Bible uses that language. But it is, it is also uh, to, to think of it as a garden within Eden. Later, we'll see that in chapter 3, Adam and Eve are exiled from the garden, but they're not exiled from Eden. It is Cain who is actually exiled from Eden. And that's why he says that the burden is too great to bear, because he's being sent into the wilderness. Okay? So, so, so the setting is taking place in the garden within Eden, and more broadly, Eden. Well, what we have started in verse 18 is the characters of the story. Okay, So we start with the setting of the garden uh, that, that's created by man. And then we have the characters. And these are essentially Adam and Eve. Now, the story will continue into chapter 3, although we, we have a chapter break there. We'll see this, probably not today, but likely next week, that chapter 2 ends... Uh, but it really is, the last two verses are really a transition from what happens in, in chapter 3, particularly the, the last verse. So, before we look at it specifically, how we need to read this passage is important. Uh, Moses clear, clearly wants us to see this as a theological narrative. Now, what we mean by that is that, yes, every story in the Bible is theological, right? Because it tells us something about God, Jesus, life death, eternity, 
etc. Right? Everything has to do with God. Right? Everything in the Bible has to do with God. However, there are times when, when, when it's very clear there is an obvious and, and clearly stated theological motive in the story. A good example of this would actually be the parables of Jesus. Right? So Jesus will say the kingdom of God is like a mustard seed or, or like a sower who went out to sow. And he sowed various or sowed seed that landed on various ground. Right? So, so he, he's telling you something theological, the kingdom of God, by the means of narrative. Right? Um, uh, Nathan the prophet does this to David. right? After David commits adultery, remember what Nathan does. Nathan says a parable. Now, it's, there's a clear application to it. And that is that, that David has sinned against God, against Uriah, Bathsheba, and all of Israel. Right? There's, so, so theological narrative is, is important for us to see. Now, this is theological narrative. And, and our application and interpretation begins there. If you look down at verse 24 and 25, I think this is where uh, it's very, very evident what Moses is doing. You'll notice that verse 23 ends with Adam talking. Uh, Eve has been created. He says, this is bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh, right? This is woman. She, she's she's my, my, my kind of kind of girl. Um, but in verse 24, the, the, the voice changes. It's not Adam speaking, nor is Eve speaking. Eve hasn't said anything yet. Notice it says, verse 24, therefore. That's interesting, isn't it? So we see here that therefore doesn't continue the narrative. It interrupts the narrative. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. You see the theology there. This is the narrator injecting himself into the story. And he's saying, look, whatever you get out of the story, be sure you get this. That because of what God did with Adam and Eve, man must leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two will become one flesh. Right? He says, whatever you get out of the story, be sure to get that much. Okay? So, so as we read, we need to see that this isn't just about two individuals. This is just as much um, about us. Okay? This is about how we understand our lives gender, marriage, and our relationship with, with God. Well, with that said, let's, let, let's begin here. Uh, to do this, I want us to look at the two characters. We'll start with the first character introduced here, and that, of course, is Adam. Now, last week, we, we spent a lot of time discussing how Eden is the prototype temple. Right? And, and we talked about the motif of the temple throughout the Bible. It starts with creation and, and Eden in particular. It ends with the, the, the new temple, which is the presence of God in the new heavens and the new earth. Right? And, and throughout the Bible, you, you see this, this motif of the temple. So, so you, you've got Eden, you've got the ark, you've got the tabernacle, Solomon's temple, Zerubbabel's temple, Herod's temple, Jesus, the church, and the new heavens and the new earth. Right? That is a theme that runs throughout. And with that comes... The priest theme, right? So we have Adam as the first priest, and then you meet this Melchizedek guy in uh, in Genesis that, that no one really knows what to do with him. Um, and then then you you've got the uh, the, the line of, of Aaron, right? The, the Levites uh, who, who serve as priests, um, and then and then um, uh, Jesus is seen as a high priest, right? We see that in Hebrews, and that continues through, throughout the Bible. Uh, so we spend some time on that. Uh, but there's a real application to that, why it matters, is remember that Adam means man, Adam. In fact, in Genesis 1 and 2, most of the time that you see the word translated man, the Hebrew word is Adam, Adam. So Adam is a proper name. It's also a generic noun, Adam and man. And, and Moses weaves them with some ambiguity because he wants you to ask, does this apply just to Adam or does it apply to men in general? And I think the priestly role of Adam, though we can't take it too far, does in fact apply to men. After all, I believe that, that the husband and father of the house is called to be the primary pastor of the home. Although I, I love being a pastor and, and investing in, in families and individuals, the primary pastor of children and, and of the home should be the husband. He should pastor his wife and children. 
What an awesome responsibility that really is. There is a spiritual role to masculinity. But it isn't just priests that Adam is compared to here. He's also compared to kings. He is a prototype of king. And, and if we had time, we would trace the priest-king motif throughout the Bible. Like Melchizedek actually is a great example of that. He's presented to us as both a king and as a priest. Now the climax of this is ultimately Jesus, who is the priest king, right? The prophet, priest, and king. Uh, but I want to show you how this works in the text. Um, go back to chapter 1, um, where we're, we're first introduced to, to man. In verse 26 through 27, uh, we are told that man, Adam, is called to rule. Uh, it says, God said, let us make man in our image, after our likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the heavens, over the livestock, over all the creeping thing that creeps in the earth. Um, so God created them, right? Verse 28. And God said, be fruitful, multiply, fill the earth, subdue it, have dominion over the fish of the sea, the birds of the heavens, and over every living thing that moves on the earth. Notice there that God calls Adam to rule. Your translation may actually even say that Adam is to rule over creation. Now that word there is often associated with kings and vice regents of kings. So, so the king may describe how he rules over his kingdom. But at times in the Old Testament, that same word may describe how the king trusts one of his officials to, to rule over uh, a certain area or, or to rule over the military, something like that. So this is clearly a, a kingly term that we see throughout, throughout Scripture. Likewise, you see the word subdue. The Hebrew word subdue. We've already discussed that man is vice-regent over God's creation. And so he's told to, to subdue the earth. Now the word carries the idea of subjecting, bringing into bondage, making subservient, to dominate, to tread down, all of this. Uh, but its use in the Old Testament is often a military use. Not always, but often it's a military use. For example, God is said to subdue the promised land. You can see it in Numbers 32, 22. God tells uh, the people of Israel, don't worry about what you see in the promised land, in the land of Canaan. I will subdue it, right? I will bring it under subjection. In the same way, Moses and Joshua are said to subdue the land. One example is Joshua 18. It says, And the whole congregation of the people of Israel assembled at Shiloh and set up the tent of meeting there. The land lay subdued before them. Same word used here in Genesis chapter 1. So Joshua, as a military leader, subdued the land. Likewise, David, is, this word is applied to David. These also King David dedicated to the Lord together, this is 2 Samuel 8, with the silver and gold that he dedicated from all the nations he subdued. So we see that, that this is kingly language. That, that Adam isn't just called to name animals, right, and, and, and to till the ground. He has responsibility of that, of a type of king. Uh, he's also to the fruitful and multiply. I think this means more than reproduction, but it carries with it responsibility of uh, just parenthood being, being one. Uh, but also, we need to know the Garden of Eden is an example of this. We talked about this last week, so we won't spend a lot of time on it. In the ancient Near East, lavish gardens were the property of kings. And so, um, the king, part of his palace, would be a, an adjacent garden that would have fruit trees, it would have water, it would have uh, animals. That, that, that he could haunt or, or enjoy. It, it would be, uh, uh, park is the closest thing we have, but it's much more lavish than that. And, and Moses understands this imagery. And, and where, what do we find in this garden? We find the king exercising dominion over God's creation as his vice regent. So, so it's, it's, it's good for us theologically to see that Adam is priest, yes, but he also is a type of king. Now, when we think of king, particularly as Americans, we struggle with the idea of kingship as Americans because we kind of rebelled against one over 200 years ago. Uh, but when we think of king, we need to think of a benevolent king, not a boss, not a dictator, uh, not anything like that. That's not how God describes the ideal king. 
but rather Adam is called to rule and to serve um, in this garden. Well, with that said, let's, let's look at the text it, itself. Verse 18 says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man, Adam, should be alone. Now, immediately, that should jump off the page. If you've been with us since the very beginning, at least since verse 3 of, of Genesis 1, you've noticed that God says good seven times. And that number seven is not an accident. He says it on each day of creation, and he says it on the seventh day. Remember that, that, that God, um, God rested from his good creation because all of it is good. That's why it's important for us to see that this is a zero in on singular day of creation. Yes, the light was good, the land was good, the, the plants were good, the animals were good, the sea monsters and the birds, uh, the, the sun, moon, and stars, all of that is good because it reflects the creation of a good creator, an artist even. All of a sudden, we see in the text, there was one thing and only one thing in all the cosmos that wasn't good. And notice, God tells us, Moses tells us, who or what wasn't good. Now he, he, he breaks this down because how we understand this will help us understand masculinity, marriage, family, what it means to be human, all of that sort of stuff. So, so what, what isn't good here in the text? Well, first of all, um, uh, he says that it's not good that man should be alone and that man needs a helper. Okay? So, so we, we have a, a couple of things to, to look at here. Um, one, we need to see that uh, we need to begin with our discussion with this, particularly that language of helper. We need to see that um, it is not good that man is alone. And I believe that is more than just Adam. It certainly includes Adam. I've done a lot of ministry with men and women particularly those who, who are in isolation or who have lost a spouse, something like that. There, there is a difference between, uh, between men and women when it comes to loneliness. Now, everyone gets lonely. Both men and women get lonely. But, but if there is a clear difference in, in our ability, particularly men's ability to handle loneliness. I tell my wife and kids all the time that uh, if, if, if my wife wants to go uh, visit the in-laws, you know, whatnot, and see, see her family, take the kids with her, and I'm, I'm, I'm here, you know, working and, and serving and whatnot, I can do that for about two or three days. And then the isolation loneliness really starts to set in. Now, both men and women struggle with this, but so, so I think there's a general application that man was not, mankind was not left to be alone. But I think there's a specific application to, to men in particular. Now, we need to note here in the text that mankind was not created for as, as, as isolated individuals. Rather, we were created to be part of community. We were created as relational beings. We were created for intimacy. Now, I can show you that in the Bible, right? In fact, you can go back to Genesis 1. Notice that it says, God says, let us, plurality, let us, and I believe that's the Godhead, the Trinity, let us make man in our image, in our likeness. So we see that, that part of what it means to be an image bearer is this need and desire to, to be in community, to, be, to have good relationships. But... Really, we don't even have to go that deep, do we? Chances are, you're, you're, you're checking in here not only because you, you, you want to study God's Word, but also because, let's be honest, you're bored. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, we are struggling as a people, aren't we, with social distancing, with isolation. Sometimes we, 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 we just want to go out for a walk just because we're, we're tired of being alone. We call each other up because we're tired of being alone. One of the things this crisis is teaching us is that we weren't meant to be in isolation. We weren't, we weren't meant to be lonely individuals. No, we were meant for each other. Now, again, I, I think that's true in general for men and women. But I also think it, it's, it's very true for men. This is an area of real struggle. Young single guys, this, this is an area of real struggle for them. 
widowers, it's going to be a real struggle for them. Not that it isn't for, for young women or, or, or widows, but, but, but uh, it, it seems to be an even deeper challenge for, for men. And as we get there, so, so it's not good for man to be alone. So what is God's answer? He would provide for Adam a helper. And it is here, I'm kind of nice, I'm kind of glad, it's nice that uh, I'm here by myself, right? Uh, no one can throw things at me yet. I'm sure there's a tomato emoji you can text me or something. Um, I've taught this passage a lot, and, and there's usually those who say, look, I, I understand that, I agree with it. And then, then there are those who say, um, I reject that wholeheartedly because it, it, it doesn't mesh with what we're being told in broader how do we reconcile that Eve, who hasn't been introduced officially yet, but we know where this is going, that Eve is described as a helper, and it sounds like she is lesser than Adam. So how do we affirm the biblical teaching and unaffirm those unhelpful interpretations? Okay, So let's think about this. Well, first of all, we need, to, we need to state clearly that both men and women are made in the image of God. So we've already looked at this passage, and we just referenced it a second ago. We go all the way back to chapter 1, and it is clear that in the eyes of God, men and women are equal. And that statement there, though it may seem obvious to you and I, is a radical message for the majority of human history. If you go back to, to the Genesis of when Genesis was written in the ancient Near East history, that message that both men and women are made in the image of God was a radical message that no one could, could have fathomed. For one, the, the ancient Near Eastern uh, creation stories did not tell us, according to their traditions, how women were created. You had a great story about how men were created. Why? Because in a patriarchal society, you have clearly a ranking of men above women. And often women were lower than, than other uh, creatures in, in, in other parts of God's creation. Here comes the Hebrew Bible and has the audacity to say that in God's eyes, and if it's in God's eyes, it should be in our eyes and application, men and women are equal. So anything we say moving forward, if you interpret as clearly this guy on my phone thinks women are subservient to men, you didn't hear me right. And, and you need to go back and rethink what, what I've tried to articulate. Men and women are equal in the eyes of God. But I want you to notice that term, that the wife here for Adam, Eve, is created to be a helper to him. Now the Hebrew word here is ezer. It, it just means helper or help. Now, I believe that this description lifts women up it does not, as is wrongly assumed, that it tears them down. I believe this is a beautiful depiction of Eve and, and femininity in general. Let me see if I can articulate this. First of all, consider the end of that English word helper. Right? So if, if I say, I've got two rocks here. One is big, the other is bigger. Okay? We understand how, how these words work, right? Now take the word helper. If the man needs a helper, what does that say of the man? Right? ER is always in the context of comparison. The word bigger doesn't make sense unless you understand the meaning of big. So if the man is in need of a helper and she is the helper, what does that make the man in need of? Help. Right? It's not good that Adam is alone. He, creation itself is incomplete without the climax and the conclusion of creation, and that is Eve. Adam needs help, but he needs help from one who is like him and equal to him. Because he is a, she is a helper for the one who needs help. Furthermore, we need to notice that if you think that it is it is diminutive to say that Eve is lesser than Adam because of this description, then what you're saying is that God is lesser than men because God is described as a helper. In fact, let me show you two ways this is done. 
This is done through names, and it's done through, through just crying out to God for help, okay? So, so we meet a guy in Exodus 18, not the only one, but just, just I'll give you one example. Exodus 18, um, there is a guy whose name is Eleazar. Now, even in English, you can almost hear it. If the word for helper is Ezer, Eleazar is, is the proper name which means, and the text at Exodus 18 tells us what it means. It means, the God of my father was my help and delivered me from Pharaoh. You see it in there? So what you have here is a family, a mom and dad, particularly the father would typically name, name the child. And in the context of the Exodus, right, where they're fleeing Egypt, they name this child, essentially, God is my help. Furthermore, we, we see that cry for God's help throughout the Old Testament. I, I was going to try to give you all of them, and just became too many. Let me give you a few. Uh, Deuteronomy 33, 26. There is none like God, O Jerusalem, who rides through the heavens to, to your help. Same word that describes you. Verse 29. Happy are you, O Israel, who, who is like you, a people saved by the Lord, the shield of your help. There's tons of examples in the psalm. Psalm 20, verse 2. May he send you Ezer. May he send you help from the sanctuary and give you the support of Zion. Psalm 33, 20. Our soul waits for the Lord. He is our Ezer. He is our help and our shield. Psalm 70, verse 5. But I am poor and needy. Hasten to me, O God. You are my Ezer, my help and my deliverer. 15, 9, and 10. Oh, Israel, trust in the Lord. He is their easer and shield. Oh, house of Aaron, trust in the Lord. He is their easer and their shield. He repeats himself twice, verbatim, for the sake of emphasis. Psalm uh, 121, 2, I will, uh, 121, verse 1 and 2, I will lift up my eyes to the hills. Where does my easer come from? My easer comes from the Lord who made heaven. Amazing psalm. I look up, where does help come from? I need a helper, the psalmist cries out. Where does it come from? It comes from Yahweh. Psalm 124, 8. Our easer, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. Notice the connection between, in Psalm 124, between creation and help. God helps Adam who is our divine helper by giving him the gift of Easter. So no, I, I don't think this, this diminishes the role or the importance of women. I, I think it actually lifts them up. And I think there's a practical side of this. I, I think if we're honest with ourselves, if, if, if I were to run through a series of common vocations, we... Uh, Perhaps somewhat wrongly, but we do assign gender naturally to, to one uh, profession to another. One of the things I find, is I've done this experiment with students, uh, with churches, uh, with college students and everything. What I've found is, is if I were to say construction worker, you would automatically attach men to that. Are there women construction workers? Of course. But if I were to say nurse, you would automatically presume a gender to that role. Women. Now, are there men who serve as nurses? Oh, of course. It's not a perfect science. It's just a general statement. One of the things I've found is that is that a lot, a lot of times women are drawn to, to, to vocations and opportunities of aid and help, which helps make our world a better place. Right now, we are to be thankful Yes, for doctors and nurses, both men and women, right, during this crisis. But it's fascinating that even though we've fought against some of this, particularly with radical feminism, we still almost kind of fit within these categories without even thinking about it. Now, to, to be clear, help does not mean savior, or servant, rather. Help does not mean servant. Now, the Bible demands all the children of God to serve. So that means that godly men in the home, outside the home, are called by God to be servants. 
Okay? All men are called to that. I'm a guy and I'm called to service. Likewise, all godly women are called to serve. In fact, if you approach your marriage as a 50-50 sort of thing, your marriage ain't going to last very long. So if you say, honey, I'll, I'll do the, I'll mow the yard, you wash the dishes. Okay? Good. That's 50-50. I'll do half, you do the other half, and we'll get this thing done. Yeah. Good luck with that. You know what's going to happen? Husband, you're going to forget to mow the yard. She hasn't forgotten to do the dishes. 50-50 does work. Or vice versa. You're out there sweating to mow the yard when you come in, and then all the dishes are undone, and you can't find a spare cup to drink some water from, right? What's going to happen? I've done my job. Why don't you do your job? No, marriage is 100%, 100%. How can I meet your needs in serving? So when we hear the word helper, it does involve servant, but it doesn't mean slave. It means serving. It doesn't mean slavery. Both men and women are called to serve. And a church, in a marriage, a, a community can't exist without us serving one another. So we err when we presume that God demands women, and wives in particular, to do everything that the husband wants her to do. That is not what the Bible teaches at all. Uh, and a man who does that is not, is not loving his wife, nor is he serving her. Husbands need help, not slaves or servants. Lastly, in this regard, help does not mean you fix. Now, I think this is really practical, so, so stick with me. Many of you all know, because I've joked about it, I'm not a big fan of the Disney princesses. And with that said, our daughter eats them up, right? She, she, she loves Barbie, she loves all the princesses, and the ones she likes the most are the ones I like the least. It, it's ironic how that works in every family, isn't it? One common theme, um, particularly with uh, the Beauty and the Beast, but, but other ones do, but Beauty and the Beast is best known for this, is the lie that Belle can fix the guy. Uh, and many see this as a type of metaphor that, that that if, if you would just meet the right woman, she'll fix him up. A lot of young girls, they want that. In an effort to be a good helper, they see themselves as a type of savior. Ladies, particularly young ladies, don't fall for that trap. If you're in a relationship and he's a loser, don't try to fix him. Point him to his savior. Because you're not it. You're not it. You're never going to be it. Men don't want to be fixed by the, by, by the women they love. They never can be. Now, what, what, what men need is the same thing women need. And that, of course, is a savior. The best thing you can do is appoint each other to a savior. But with that said, we've jumped ahead, haven't we? The text says, look, it's not good that man is alone. He needs a helper. But if you just read the text, what we, must, we, we know what's coming. If you just read it, Eve hasn't been introduced. Marriage hasn't been introduced. A wife hasn't been introduced. Family isn't there. Nothing's there. It's just the statement. It's not good that Adam is alone, that mankind is alone. So what does God do? We would assume that verse 18 says it's not good for man to be alone. Verse 19, here's Eve. Right, right, your problem solved, right? On to the next task, or it may be the way many men think. That's not what God does. God shows Adam the depth of his loneliness, that there is nothing in this world, in all of creation, that, that, that can meet that need. Not yet. So verse 19 and 20, we have, Now out of the ground, the Lord God informed every beast of the field, every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man, and he would call them. Notice, that's just... He's not saying that now they've been created. He's saying they've already been created. He's bringing them to Adam, who's in the garden. And what we have here in naming the animals is his role as a type of priest king. He's in the temple. He's exercising his role as king, right? And so, so he names them, right? And so Adam is surrounded by life, beauty, creation. So in one sense, he's not alone. He's got his his favorite dog running around, right? Playing fetch. But it's inadequate for, for what his need is. They're not helpers. He needs someone like him, but isn't him at the same time. 
And it's interesting, in naming the animals, in verse 19 and 20, Adam is busy. He works. He rules. But it's not enough. It's not enough. After all, Adam was created to work and rule. But he wasn't only created to work and to rule. It is in that context by which Adam sees his deep need. Then we get, as we'll pick up next week, the creation of Eve. He's done all this work, but there he stands in the garden. And what happens? The implications of this are endless, and we'll see them more when we get down to verse 21. Is not here, man needs help. Now that doesn't mean that singleness is sin, or that God doesn't use singleness. He does. And if we had time, we could explore that important issue. Paul discusses it in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7. When he's been given the gift of celibacy, he uses it for the glory of God. But most men haven't been given that gift. So what we see then is both marriage and celibacy is a gift of God. Now, the Roman Catholic Church doesn't hold to that. They hold celibacy as a higher uh, as a higher pursuit than marriage. The Bible shows, because right here, Eve is a gift to Adam. So marriage is a gift from God. It should be enjoyed as a gift from God. But to those who have been given the gift of celibacy, they haven't received something lesser than it. They've received a gift from God, and thus called by God to use that gift the glory of God. So whether you are married or in a serious relationship aiming towards marriage, or whether you're struggling and have not been given this gift of celibacy, the main thing to do, regardless of your circumstances, use the gifts that God has given you for his glory, for his praise. Well, next week we'll pick up uh, there starting in verse uh, 21 uh, when Adam takes a nap and he wakes up and he's married. No doubt there's a lot of young men who wish that's the way it still worked. But guys, let's, let's, uh, let's pray and we will be dismissed. Thank you all for, for joining, joining us here. Um, I'm still getting used to uh, um, addressing a congregation through uh, while in, in the sanctuary that is empty, but uh, I trust these have been beneficial for you as they have been for me. Never regret studying God's word. And I trust that's the same for you. Remember, Sunday morning, 9.30. Let us know if you're interested. If you haven't already received the link, 9.30 for Sunday school, Danny will be teaching. And then 11 o'clock for live worship on Facebook. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. God, thank you for your love and mercy. Thank you for those who have taken time out of their Wednesday evenings to study your word and to praise your name. Uh, may we be faithful to that. Help us to think as men and as women about what your word says and how it applies to our lives. Be with our, our homes, our marriages, our families, our church, our community. As we navigate through these waters, and may we come out of it stronger and as better disciples to meet the needs of this world. Lord, I lift up to you everyone who may be watching right now. Use them, bless them, send them. In the name of your glorious Son, we pray. Amen. Thank you, guys.